Robert Rosencrantz. Hi. So, Bob, as I always ask you before these debates, why this one and why now? Uh, well, the reason why now is because the theme of uh, taxes and tax policy has been uh, a very divisive uh, theme throughout the presidential campaign and the presidential debates, and we're trying to bring this to a uh, perhaps more sophisticated level here tonight. And this, this motion has a tricky word, enough. What, what do we intend by putting the word enough into this motion? Well, I, I thought really that there would be three criteria by which one might uh, decide that. One is the matter of fairness, one is efficiency, and one is sufficiency. Okay, take us through fairness, what it means for each side. Well, for the pro the motion side, fairness would be the point of view of somebody in the top 1% who's paying 40% of all the taxes in America, or the top 5%, which is paying 60% they're going to see the system as fair. Uh, on the other hand, if you work for a billionaire who's paying a lower tax rate than you are, you're not going to see it as fair. And sufficiency? Sufficiency really means, are we raising enough revenues uh, to put the government on a fiscal path that makes some sense? And I think the uh, pro the motion side is going to point to the fact that uh, uh, it's really spending that's the problem. We're spending about 24% of GNP on uh, federal expenditures. The norm in the last 20 years has been about 21%, and we've got to get spending under control. The other side is going to say, wait a second, tax collections are only about, uh, about 16% of GNP compared to 19%. We need to raise more money, and if uh, we remember the words of Willie Sutton, go where the money is. And efficiency was the last part of it you mentioned. Well, efficiency is the idea of promoting economic growth. What kind of tax system would best uh, stimulate the growth in the economy? And I think the pro-motion side is going to argue that uh, uh, it's very, very important to preserve the incentives that the rich, quote unquote, have to risk money, to invest, to create jobs for others. The against the motion side is probably going to point to the fact that a dollar in the hands of a middle class family is going to be spent and in a direct way stimulate economic activity, whereas a dollar extra in the hands of a rich person might just sit there. All right, Bob, thanks very much. And that slicing the word enough, slicing that salami left has a lot of meanings, and thank you for framing this for us. And uh, let's welcome our debaters to the stage. Good. I'll take that. And may I invite one more round of applause for Robert Rosencrantz for bringing this to us. If you're asked, do the rich pay their fair share in taxes, you really do have to ask a couple of other questions. You've got to ask, well, what do we mean by rich? How much, how much is rich? How much money does that take? And what do we mean by enough? Now, consider that to be counted in the top 1% of earners in America, you need to be making approximately $380,000 a year. Consider also that that 1% pays more than a third, as of 2009, pays more than a third of all of the federal income tax that comes in to the federal government. Is that too much? Is that too little? Well, let's make a debate of it. True or false, the rich are taxed enough. Another debate from Intelligence Squared US. I'm John Donvan. We have four superbly qualified debaters who will be arguing for and against this motion. The rich are taxed enough. They go in three rounds, and then the audience votes to choose a winner, and only one side wins. Our debaters include, on the side arguing for the motion, Glenn Hubbard, Dean of Columbia Business School and Economic Advisor to Mitt Romney. Your partner is Art Laffer. He is best known for the Laffer Curve and one of the main theoretical constructs of supply-side economics.
On the side arguing against the motion, Robert Reich. He's a professor at UC Berkeley and former Secretary of Labor in the Clinton administration. And his partner, Mark Zandi. He's chief economist of Moody's Analytics. Our motion is this, the rich are taxed enough. Let's meet our debaters and welcome first, Glenn Hubbard. Glenn, you are dean of the Columbia Business School. You are also, uh, throughout 2012, you've been an advisor to Mitt Romney's campaign. Uh, recently, you were profiled in the New York Times, and you were described there as succinct, authoritative, and unabashedly partisan. I want to know, is that fair? Are you unabashedly partisan? And could you be succinct and authoritative? Well, I am. <laughs> I am always succinct. Uh, I, to the partisan, I guess I'm old enough to remember when Bill Bradley and I collaborated on an idea that's not too far dissimilar to tonight, and uh, President Obama's housing plans follow work uh, by me and by a colleague at Columbia. And your partner is? My partner is Art Laffer. Ladies and gentlemen, Art Laffer. Art, you were uh, an economic advisor to President Reagan. You served as chief uh, economist at the Office of uh, Management and Budget. You're best known as the father of supply-side economics because of the curve that is named after you. And I, I think it's fortuitous that your, your last name was not McDougal or Rabinovitz or, or Kowalski because we would be talking about the Kowalski curve. I, your, your name adds a certain lightheartedness to your curve. <laughs> and you are a lighthearted guy. In two sentences or less, what is the Laffer Curve about? Well, number one, the Laffer Curve really is my profile. <laughs> <laughs> and the other famous thing about me is that I'm a little bit taller than Robert Reich. <laughs> Our motion is the rich are taxed enough. The rich are taxed enough. And here to argue against the motion, Robert Reich. You're a professor of public policy at UC Berkeley, former Secretary of Labor in the Clinton administration. You are a bit of an intellectual brawler yourself, and you can dish it out. You've also had to take it. Uh, Bill O'Reilly recently called you a communist who secretly adores Karl Marx. <laughs> Neil Cavuto said you're a sanctimonious twit. <laughs> the question is, does this stuff really hurt your feelings? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> No, it doesn't. Actually, I don't know how Bill Riley knew that I was a secret admirer of Karl Marx, because if it was secret... <laughs> <laughs> and and you your partner... the logic on that side of the aisle? I'm... And your partner is? My partner is the incomparable uh, Mark Zandi. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Zandi. John, Mark I'm is... nervous about this now. You're going to be nice, right? You're going to be nice. This is so easy. Yeah, okay, all right. You are all the right. chief economist of Moody's Analytics, uh, and you have one of the most widely followed economic forecasts. That was nice. That was nice. That was yeah. very nice. I'll take that. Uh, I'm a great the, guy, too. Here's, here's the other part of it. When the Bush cuts neared uh, expiration in 2010, you at that time were in favor of their extension initially? Yes, I was, yeah. Now? Uh, I think uh, the president's proposal is the appropriate proposal. Allow the tax rates for upper income individuals to. So expire. you do get to change your mind? No, I, I am an eclectic economist uh, in that uh, I think uh, the economics depend on the times, and the times now are such that uh, we, we've got to address our fiscal problems. Thank you, Mark Zandi. Ladies and gentlemen, our debaters for this evening. Now, in this debate, you, our live audience, act as our judges. By the time the debate has ended, we will have asked you to vote twice, once before you've heard the arguments, and once again after you've heard the arguments, and the team whose numbers have moved your vote the most from beginning to end will be declared our winner. So let's register the first vote. If you go to the keypad that's at the right hand of your seat, our motion is this, the rich are taxed enough. If you agree with that motion as you come in off the street, push number one. If you disagree, push number two. If you're undecided, push number three. All of the other keys you can ignore, they're inoperable. Um, and you can also correct yourself if you've pushed the wrong button. And again, uh, this is being, uh, these are wireless devices, so they're all re being recorded backstage and tabulated. And then at the end of the evening, uh, it takes about as long as it takes for me to finish this sentence, we'll have the results again quickly comparing the two votes. All right, let's launch. 
Our motion is the rich are taxed enough. On to round one, opening statements from each of our debaters in turn and speaking first for the motion, the rich are taxed enough. Glenn Hubbard, who is Dean of the Columbia Business School. He is Chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under President George W. Bush, a former Deputy Assistant Secretary for Tax Policy in the Treasury Department. Ladies and gentlemen, Glenn Hubbard. Thank you. Thanks. I'd certainly like to thank Intelligence Squared and the Richmond Center for an event on a topic this important. My partner, uh, Art Laffer, the eponymous economist, uh, will follow with uh, some great thoughts on why raising tax rates is the wrong place to start. But I just want to make two points uh, this evening. First, raising tax rates on the rich is both counterproductive and unnecessary to fund the government that Americans have traditionally had. I'll come back to that point. Second, if we do want a larger government, and that's a political choice, the extra taxes to pay for that government will largely come from the non-rich. Now let's start with how high tax rates are. If you look at survey data and ask Americans what they think is fair, people generally answer that about a quarter or a bit more would be fair in taxes paid. If that's true, the current and projected marginal tax rates, that is the tax rate on the next dollar that you earn, are very high for upper income folks, 35% for ordinary income. And if you're New Yorkers in this audience, you know that by omitting state and local taxes, I'm leaving a lot on the table here. And 15% for dividends and capital gains. But of course, corporate taxes were already paid there. And on top of that, there's an estate tax that taxes money that had already been taxed once or twice in someone's lifetime. All of these taxes are set to rise substantially next year 40% for earned income, 44% for dividends, 24% for capital gains, and beyond. Now, the calls for higher tax rates really raise two concerns. First, if you step back, they treat the nation's income as an already baked pie, and it doesn't really matter for the size of that pie how it's sliced. An economic observation of that is that ignores a lot of incentives that taxes have on the decisions we all make. Those sorts of incentives would lead to lower activity, lower jobs, and lower income. The second choice here is that the real fiscal policy choice facing the nation is really about the size of government. And here my observation isn't economics, it's just arithmetic. If we want the larger government, we all will have to pay for it. The bulk of the taxes will come from the non-rich. Now let's start first on the cost of raising tax rates. Now I can look out and tell that your favorite course in college was, of course, economics. And you remember from the public finance lecture in that class, you could boil it down to a simple sentence, if you tax something, you get less of it. And economists worry particularly about tax rates that are already high. Now, some of the somethings we get less of are work and saving. And here, I just want to offer you a forecast. And I should be honest with you that President Bush once said about me that Glenn can't even forecast the past. And I think, I think what the president meant was data get revised. But you take that for what it's worth. But economists like me and my own academic research have forecast changes in taxable income from changes in tax rates. The responses of high income taxpayers are not only absolutely high, they are much higher than the responses of other taxpayers. Of particular concern in this regard is the taxation of business income. High business taxes discourage investments in machines and ideas and jobs. More than half of Americans who work in the private sector work for businesses whose owners pay taxes at individual rates. Raising taxes on those business owners discourages hiring, discourages investment. If you make a comparison of next year's tax law with higher rates to the much ballyhooed Bowles Simpson plan, you'd find that the lower tax rates in Bowles Simpson that are financed by broadening the tax base would raise investment in businesses by 54% and raise hiring by 14%. And high tax rates don't necessarily produce revenue. The fact that revenue shares in GDP haven't varied substantially across periods when the top marginal rate was more than 70% from when it was less than or about 28% suggests that we have a lot of lost taxable income and a lot of wasteful tax planning 
when we have high tax times? The right answer is tax reform to raise money from upper income households by broadening the tax base and to seek expenditure reform that also reduces benefits for those taxpayers. Now, what about the larger government? Before the financial crisis, federal spending in the US averaged about 20% of GDP for many decades. What if we decide we'd like a bigger government? Let's say 25%, or maybe a larger number like many European countries, shouldn't raising tax rates on the rich pay for that government? Well, the simple answer is no, or more accurately, it, it can't. If you look across the OECD, the club of rich industrial nations, you'll find something that may surprise some of you. The US has the most progressive tax system. And in fact, the US tax system actually decreased inequality more than any other country's tax system. So you think to yourself, well, how can this be? We're thinking of European nations with large governments and social welfare programs. But the answer is simple. For reasons of arithmetic, that is, there's just not that much income at the top, and economics, consequences for investment and for jobs would be too grim, those nations actually use broad-based consumption taxes, like a VAT that are borne by all citizens to fund their spending. So the real choice is the size of government. That's the debate we need to have first. Taxation should be fair, but it should also seek to advance growth and living standards. The right tax system for this country can accomplish both. And so, for the government of the size that we all have been used to for the, before the past few years, we can, we should, accomplish both fairness and growth without raising tax rates on high-income individuals. If we, the body politic, want a larger government, we all must pay. The rich are not a plug number in a budget gambit for a free lunch. For the proposition the rich are taxed enough, the answer is clear, and it's yes. Thank you, Glenn Hubbard. Our motion is the rich are taxed enough. And now here to speak against the motion, I'd like to introduce Robert Rice. He is the Chancellor's Professor of Public Policy at the University of California at uh, uh, Berkeley and the former Secretary of Labor in the Clinton administration. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Rice. As you can see, the economy has worn me down. But we're in a recovery. <laughs> uh, look, uh, I think this is an absurd motion, and I urge you to vote against it when you have a chance to vote against it again. Uh, it's an absurd motion for the following reasons. Number one, we have a huge budget deficit. Even if we didn't want to expand the size of government, even if we want to contract the size of government, we still have a gigantic budget deficit. It's about, and the debt is about 85% by some measures of gross domestic product. And the question is, how do you get the deficit down? How do you get the debt down? Uh, well, almost everybody who has looked at the issue has said it's got to be some combination of tax increases and spending cuts. The simpson bowles Commission, uh, to which uh, my esteemed colleague ref uh, referred to, uh, said, well, we have $1 of tax increases for every $3 of spending cuts. But there are going to be some tax increases. And the real question here isn't the size of government. The real question here is, who is going to bear the brunt of the tax increases? Is it going to be people mostly at the top? Or is it going to be people who are in the middle? Or is it going to be people who are poor? And I want to tell you, in terms of common sense and logic and fairness, it ought to be people at the top. Why? Why? You can applaud, but don't take away from my time. <laughs> Why? Because number one, uh, people at the top have never had it so good. I mean, the, the percentage of total income in this country, going to people who are in the top 1%, has doubled over the past 30 years. It used to be 10% back in 1980. It's now over 20%. That is, people in the top 1% are now getting over 20% of total income. If you're in the top 1 tenth of 1%, you just, your, your share didn't just double, it actually tripled over the last 30 years. If you're in the top 1 one-hundredth of 1%, your share quadrupled of total income 
over the last 30 years. The, the richest 400 Americans have more wealth than the bottom 150 million of us put together. And this kind of asymmetry, this kind of distorted uh, gap between the top and the wealthiest people and everybody else is really something new in this country, at least within people's living memory. It wasn't this way in the 50s or 60s or 70s. It wasn't even nearly this way in the 80s. So if we're going to have to raise taxes, obviously fairness and logic would indicate you raise them on the top. Now, Glenn Hubbard is talking about, uh, well, you have a negative uh, effect on, on a negative incentive effect. Come on, as in the immortal words of, of Joe Biden, malarkey. <laughs> I mean, look, uh, uh, look uh, uh, the, the tax rate, the, the marginal tax rate on top incomes uh, go back uh, before 1981. Uh, for at least three decades before 1981, the top marginal tax rate in this country was at least 70%. Under Dwight D. Eisenhower, President Dwight D. Eisenhower, Republican, who nobody would have accused of uh, being a socialist. Bill O'Reilly would not have called him a communist. And yet, the marginal tax rate on the top incomes under Eisenhower was 91%. If you get rid of all the deductions and tax credits, it's still the effective tax rate under Eisenhower is close to 56%, much higher than anybody today is talking about, we're talking, right now we're talking about the difference between what, uh, a 35% tax rate and maybe going back to Bill Clinton's days? I mean, this is a ridiculous debate. It should not even be debated. Obviously, given where we were before and where we are now, uh, we shouldn't even be, be raising this question. I mean, they will say that higher taxes have a negative impact on economic growth. Well, guess what? In the three decades before 1981, when taxes were higher on the rich, the economy, on average, per year, grew faster than it has grown since 1981. There was no negative impact on growth. I mean, George W. Bush reduces, remember 1981, uh, uh, 2001, 2003, he reduces taxes on the wealthy, saying, oh, we're going to get this huge increase in, in growth, and we're going to get all kinds of jobs uh, using and spouting supply-side, excuse me, Art, nonsense. <laughs> Uh, and what did we get? We actually had less growth. We had fewer jobs. Even before the Great Crash, uh, we had uh, an economy that did not perform nearly as well as it did under the president I was very proud to have served under, that is Bill Clinton, uh, who raised taxes. We had the largest and longest uh, boom in modern memory. Uh, 22 million new jobs were created. That wasn't a negative growth. That was not a slowdown in growth. We raised taxes. 22 million new jobs were created. I was Secretary of Labor during those times. I created every single one of those jobs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, just uh, in summary, uh, we have to raise taxes in order to deal, to deal with a budget deficit, regardless of what your particular ideology is about a smaller or a larger government. Uh, number two, the rich have done extraordinarily well. Everybody else hasn't. Uh, in fact, median family incomes since 2000 have actually dropped 8%. You want to put more taxes on average working people? No. That's simply not fair. It's not going to work. Number three, the rich right now bear a lower, smaller, marginal tax burden than they have at any time in the post-war era. Of course you have to raise taxes on the rich if we're going to get on with the business of this country. So please, vote against this silly proposition. Thank you. Thank you, Robert Rice. And a reminder of where we are. We are halfway through the opening round of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate. My name is John Donvan. We have four debaters, two teams of two, who are arguing it out over this motion, the rich are taxed enough. You have heard the first two debaters, and now on to the third. I'd like to introduce and bring to the lectern Art Laffer. He is the chairman and uh, uh, of, sorry, he is the founder and chairman of Laffer Associates and Laffer Investments. He is known as the father of supply side economics, was a former advisor to President Ronald Reagan. Ladies and gentlemen, Art Laffer. Thank you. 
If I can just start with this hotel you guys got for us today, I had the craziest thing happen. I came in a little early and I went down to the health club. No, I'm not an exercise freak or anything, but I was down there and this absolutely gorgeous woman walked in. She's just beautiful. And the manager of the health club was standing right next to me. So I said, excuse me, by any chance, do you have a machine that would attract someone like that to someone like me? And the guy says, yes, I do. And he took me over to the Citicorp ATM. And I just want to say that the rich are not the Citicorp ATM. If you look at this world, and I, but Robert, you're a favorite of mine, and you have been for years, and Glenn, you did a great job on this, and Mark, I'm anticipating your comments. And, but you look at it, you got, there are only three reasons you could possibly want to raise tax rates on the rich. You're jealous of them, and Robert may be, but he's one of them. <laughs> and uh, the other thing is, you're gonna get more revenue, and you're gonna create prosperity. Those are the other two, and I'm gonna land on the, the last two, and look at the facts if I can. I mean, you know, it, in the 30 years, if you look at the growth rates there, and we can go back in time, but you know, if you look at the periods, let's say from the great, uh, from the roaring 20s, we cut tax rates back then from 73% to 25% in the roaring 20s. It was called the roaring 20s for a reason. We had enormous expansion of growth, output, and employment. The top 1% of income earners, now we have great data on the top 1% of income earners. The IRS really likes to know how much you owe them. And we have great data. The top 1% of income earners, their taxes as a share of GDP soared during the period of the Roaring Twenties. If you look at the 1930s, we raised the highest margin, well we first had in May of 1930, we had the Smoot-Hawley Tariff. Then Hoover raised the highest tax rate on the rich from 25% to 63%, then Roosevelt on January 1936 raised it from 63 to 79%, and then up to 83%. There's a reason why it was called the Great Depression. The economy was in a shambles, in large part because of the tax increases. The revenues from the top 1% of income earners as a share of GDP went down during this period. You look at the Kennedy period, where we cut the highest tax rate from 91% to 70%. We also put in the investment tax credit, accelerated depreciation, cut the corporate rate, did tariff reform as well, the Kennedy round tariff negotiation. Tax rate, it was called the, it was called the go go 60s, if you remember, a boom in the economy. And tax revenues from the top 1% of income earners went up during that period as a share of GDP. We then had the four stooges Johnson, Nixon, Ford, and Carter. Uh, which I consider to be the largest, bi uh, the largest assemblage of bipartisan ignorance probably ever put on planet Earth. If you look at that period, we had stagnation for 16 straight years. The stock market collapsed during that period. Tax revenues from the top 1% of income earners went down as a share of GDP. Then we had, oh, excuse me. Does anyone have any water? No, excuse me. Then we had Ronnie. Oh, excuse me. The, the skies opened, the sun shone forth on the planet. <laughs> The grass turned green, the, the, the animals they multiplied, the children danced in the tree streets. The, the, we cut the highest tax rates of everything we could find. Uh, we had Steiger Hansen in 78, then we cut the, I mean under Reagan cut it from 70% to 28%. If you look at the whole period from 1978 all the way to uh, 2007, we cut the highest tax rate on earned income from 50% to 35%. Uh, we cut the highest tax rates on unearned income from 70% to 15%. We cut the capital gains tax rate. We cut all of these tax rates across the board. We had a boom, and it wasn't just uh, Ronald Reagan. Robert, uh, your president, by the way, cut the capital gains tax rate dramatically. Uh, he got rid of capital gains taxes on owner-occupied homes uh, for everyone. Uh, he also got rid of the tax on, on, on uh, retirees working. Uh, which was this group between 65 and 72. Uh, he also put in welfare reform. He also cut government spending as a share of GDP by more than the next four best presidents combined. And he had the greatest secretary of labor of all time. <laughs> the, uh, but he was a big tax leader. We had huge growth during that period. If you look at what happened to the tax revenues from the top income earners. You know, in 1980, tax revenues as a share of GDP from the top 1% was 1.5% of GDP. Uh, by 2007, tax revenues from the top 1% of income earners was 3.2% of GDP. It more than doubled. Let me tell you really honestly, you're not going to get the money from these guys. 
You're not. They can hire lawyers. They can hire accountants. They can hire deferred income specialists. They can hire congressmen. They can hire senators. <laughs> they can hire, you know, when you see a group of people hanging with the president, don't for a moment think it's a group of street people trying to explain to the president what it's like being poor. They're in there for some reason, and they find it. You know, what you really want to do is get a low rate, flat tax, where you have no exceptions, no exemptions, no deductions, none of that stuff, and get them out of the business of trying to finagle their tax codes, get them out of the business of trying to influence government, get them into a position where they create prosperity and economic growth, and that is the way you got to go. We all want to increase tax rates on the rich. But we want to do it not by raising rates, which won't work. We want to do it by lowering rates and broadening the base. And if I can correct one other little mistake, Robert, just a little one. Simpson Bowles lowers the highest tax rates on the rich. And so does Rivlin Domenici. They lower rates, they broaden the base. In 86, we cut tax rates on the rich dramatically from 50% to 28%. In the Senate, 97 votes for that, three against it, including Joe Biden. Uh, what was his malarkey comment? Uh, excuse me, maybe he was looking in the mirror. Uh, but you also had Bill Bradley. Uh, you also had uh, Howard Metzenbaum. You had all of these. And you had uh, Chris Dodd and you had Teddy Kennedy. Everyone knows that you don't create growth by raising tax rates on the rich. You can't love jobs and hate job creators. And you can't, you can't tax an economy into prosperity it ain't going to happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Art Laffer. Thank you, Art Laffer. Our motion is the rich are taxed enough. And here is our final speaker making his opening statement, uh, Mark Zandi. Mark is the chief economist of Moody's Analytics and is one of the most frequently cited economists in Washington. He is also the author of this book, Paying the Price, Ending the Great Recession, and Beginning a New American Century. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Zandi. Thank you. John. Thank you. Uh, thank you, John. Thanks, Intelligence Squared and uh, Bob Rosencrantz for the opportunity. Uh, I did notice that uh, on Amazon, the price of my book is falling. That demand, supply, you know, uh, we need a little, a little more demand here. Uh, help me out. Um, let me begin by saying that, you know, it's obvious the American economy has uh, very serious challenges. Uh, but I would put two right at the top of the list. Uh, the first, this is in no particular order of importance. But the first is the skewing of the distribution of income, consumption, and wealth. And the second is our fiscal problems. Uh, the statistics here are pretty startling. Uh, let's begin with the income distribution, wealth distribution. If you take the top 20% of income earners, uh, they take home uh, over 50% of the nation's income. The top 20% take home 50% of the income. They consume 60% of the total pie. So from cars to clothing and everything in between, they consume 60%. And they own 90% of the wealth, 90% uh, of the wealth. These are pretty skewed statistics. And the more, more startling thing is they've gotten more skewed over the past 30 years. You know, you go back to the 19, early 1980s, late 1970s, uh, these statistics were very different. I'll just give you one example. Uh, I mentioned that uh, the top 20% accounts for 60% of the spending. If you go back to 1980, uh, it was uh, closer to 45%. So uh, it's skewed, and it's getting more skewed. Our fiscal problems are obviously very significant as well. Uh, if you go back to the year 2000, uh, uh, we'll give Bob credit for the 22 million jobs. Should we give you credit for the surplus in the year 2002? Okay, Bob, just, uh, Bob. Let's, let's just clap for that. Uh, that was a surplus, 2000. Uh, we've been running deficits ever since. The last fiscal year just ended. We had a deficit of 1.1 trillion. You can ask, well, what's going on? Lots of things. Uh, there's the wars. That's uh, $1.2 trillion over the last 10 years. That's Afghanistan and Iraq. There's the Bush era tax cuts. Uh, according to the nonpartisan Congressional Bud Budget Office, that cost us $1.6 trillion over a 10-year period. And of course, there's a recession, the Great Recession. And by my calculation, that's cost us about $1.8 trillion over the course of the last 10 years. You add it up, uh, it's a lot of money. So we, we got some big problems, uh, very significant issues we have to tackle. Now, the bad news is that that sounds pretty bad. <clears throat> the bad news 
is that uh, if we, uh, if these trends will continue if policymakers don't act. If they don't act, these trends will continue and this will harm economic growth. It will become very self-reinforcing in a negative way. Take the deficits. Uh, if policymakers uh, continue on with current policy, uh, if they don't um, do anything with the tax, current tax rates, if they don't cut spending as agreed to as part of the sequestration, if they don't address the payroll tax holiday, emergency UI go on and on and on, well, the nation's debt to GDP ratio is going to go from its current 70%, and by the way, it's doubled over the last 10 years from 35 to 70%. It'll go over 100% by uh, 2025. Now, all good research would show that we got a problem if that happens. It, the world's not going to work for us. At some point, investors are going to balk, interest rates are going to rise, it's going to affect investment, uh, productivity growth, and our living standards. That has to change. And the income and wealth distribution, uh, the, the forces that are driving that aren't going to, aren't, are firmly in place and they're not going to change. Uh, there's many. Um, globalization, a uh, great recent piece in the New York Times uh, uh, going over this, uh, globalization, technological change. These are all really very good things for our economy. We need to continue on with the process of globalization and certainly technological change improves all our lives. But clearly, uh, it affects the distribution of income and wealth. I'm a person with no skills and talent. I'm getting creamed uh, by trade. I'm competing against low-wage workers in China and, and India. I, I can't compete. I'm, I'm just getting crushed. And of course, high-income households are benefiting enormously, right? I mean, Glenn, uh, Art, Bob go off to China. They go to, off to India. They go off to the UK. They give a speech. They get paid very well. Unfortunately, I'm not in their class. You know, I don't get paid as well. But it's globalization that allows them to get these great returns and in their income and wealth rises. Uh, and I, I think the problem here is, is that if we don't address the skewing of the distribution of income and wealth, uh, the disenfranchised are going to say enough. And they're going to stop the process of globalization. And they're going to rebel against pace, the pace of technological change. And that's going to be to everyone's detriment, including higher income households. Now, here's the good news. We can solve this problem. And we can solve it together in a combined way. We have to think about addressing our fiscal problems through the prism of the income, of the distribution of income and wealth. So we need to cut government spending. Absolutely, uh, we have to do this. But we have to do this in a way that is intelligent and maybe means testing for entitlement programs. You know, take uh, uh, change the entitlement programs for the wealthy into insurance policies. But that only goes so far. You can't. You really wanna, we don't want to go to the point where the insurance policies become a welfare program and we lose support for things like Medicare and Social Security. That only takes us so far. So we have to address taxes. And I, you know, if I were king for the day, I wouldn't raise tax rates on anybody. And I don't think we need to, right? I am all for tax reform. Let's close the deductions. Let's close the loopholes. Let's make the tax code fairer, broaden the base. I'm all for it. But let's use the revenue to address our fiscal problems, not to cut tax rates until we're able to do that, right? I mean, that is the uh, best way. That is the way proposed by Simpson Bowles. That's the way proposed by Domenici Rivlin. That is the bi bipartisan way. So this is not hard. It's, it, we can do it. Uh, and that's the good news. Now, let me end this way with a personal note. Um, I uh, started my own company back uh, 25 years ago with a good friend and uh, my best friend and my brother. And I wasn't in the proverbial garage, but I was pretty close. Uh, I grew it into a pretty good sized uh, small business. I had 100 employees when I sold it to Moody, the Moody's Corporation. Um, and the reason I'm telling you this is because so, uh, I want to let you know that I'm not just an egghead. You know, I look like one, uh, maybe, but I'm not. Uh, so I look at these things through the, uh, in terms of data, theory, and experience. And my experience says you need to vote against this proposition. Thank you. Thank you, Mark Sandy. And that concludes round one of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate where the debaters are arguing it out over this motion, the rich are taxed enough. Now we move on to round two, and round two is where the debaters address each other and take questions from me and from you in the audience. Our motion is this, the rich are taxed enough. We have two teams of two arguing it out. Uh, the team arguing for the motion, Glenn Hubbard and Arthur Laffer, are, are basically saying that um, taxing, taxing the rich is something that is absolutely gonna backfire, that, uh, 
taxes have consequences on behavior and that the wealthy who would be the provider of jobs by being the builders of factories would be discouraged from doing so and that as a result of that, not only would they be able to dodge their taxes, as Art Laffer pointed out, by hiring lawyers, and he also said hiring senators, uh, but they will, they will also not be giving jobs to people who would help broaden the tax base. The side arguing against the motion, Robert Reich and Mark Zandi, are saying it's absolutely common sense when you have to close a budget gap to go where the money is, that uh, you, you, go to tax the, you go to tax the rich because they have a disproportionate amount of the wealth in the country to a degree that they never have before, and that the argument that uh, taxing the wealthy will lead to depressions and recessions has not been borne out over certain periods of time. Now, we know that both sides, uh, to some degree, are wandering through forests of data, uh, and, uh, and each are finding their own path possibly through the <laughs> same forest. Um, picking out different periods of time uh, to, to prove their points. But I want to go to, before we get to- But that's what to, economists do, John. Well, yeah, yeah, and it's very exciting, I have to point. Uh, <laughs> before we get to, to the, the parsing of the data, I want to get to something of an overall theme. We've been talking about the rich are taxed enough, and, and, and there, enough has a couple of connotations, and one is enough to actually uh, bring in revenues to pay for the government. The other is enough to be fair, to meet some sense of fairness. And I, I want to bring to the side that's arguing uh, for the motion that the rich are taxed enough. The question of, of, of fairness, is the system as it is now at tax rates that exist now in a system that, uh, the, the one that we have, is it fair? Art Laffer. Yeah, I'll, no, it's not. Uh, it's totally not. And let me use an example, if I may. Warren Buffett. Uh, he was sitting there asking, I have my friends and I need to have higher tax rates. And I looked at his letter to the New York Times and he said he paid a little less than $7 million in taxes. And he said his tax rate was 17.4%, which I did the math, hold back, I'm a whiz, but I divided it. He had adjusted gross income of $40 million in that year. I then went to Forbes. His wealth increased from $40 billion to $50 billion. I went to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And what you found there is he gave one and three quarters billion to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, not counting his son's foundations or his daughter's foundation. Now, as a definition of income to me, income is what you spend, what you give away, and your increase in your wealth. It's called the Simon definition of income. If you look at Bill Gates, I mean, if you look at Warren Buffett, his income that year was $12 billion, and he paid $7 million in taxes. That is a tax rate of six one hundredths of one percent on his true income. That is obnoxious. But it's not because of any rates raising would change that tax. You've got to broaden the tax base by getting rid of all these exclusions, deductions, eliminations, and tax true income at low rates. And that is what's fair. The guys who play the game, and you look at the Forbes 500, and you see all of them with their tax exemptions. Look at all the 501c3s, all the loopholes. That's what we've got to go after. Not raising tax rates in the last three people who actually pay. All right, it. let me go to Bob. Go, I, stop, I, I, Bob I, Rice. Keep on, I keep on hearing uh, my good friend, Arthur Laffer, talk about broadening the base. Uh, now, do you know exactly what he's talking about when he talks about broadening the base? Because it sounds good, doesn't it? I mean, you want to broaden the base. Everybody wants to broaden the base. But Arthur, <laughs> Arthur, let's be, let, let's be specific. Are you willing to close loopholes that the very rich are mostly taking advantage of? Yes. Okay, now wait a minute. Isn't that an increase on the, it isn't that, a, doesn't that mean a tax increase? No, I'm not Wait, talking. Wait, Arthur. I thought we're talking about tax Arthur. rate increases here. We've all gone that it's tax rates we're talking about. Everyone wants to raise taxes by creating prosperity. It would be stupid not to. Arthur. We're Arthur. talking about tax rates here, at least me. Oh, no, 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 wait, wait, Mark wait. Mark Sandy. Wait, wait, wait. The proposition, the rich are taxed enough. Taxed. Oh, what we're arguing is that we want to raise more tax revenue. We prefer to do it by broadening the tax base. I would love to do it. Now, we have to look at it from a clear-eyed perspective. Can we really, we've tried, and we've done it once or twice, to broaden the base efficiently to raise revenue. But if we can't, then we raise tax rates. But everyone would agree that we want revenue, and we want to do it through broadening the tax base. That's lower Glenn, Glenn Hub Let's yeah. bring in Glenn Hubbard. Three, three quick points here. First of all, there's been some discussion of Bowles Simpson today. I think it's important for everyone to understand the marginal tax rate, top marginal tax rate in the Bowles-Simpson compromise plan is 28%. And that's financed by broadening the tax base. If we have a healthy tax system 
the, the growth that that engenders will in fact raise revenue, yes, but it's not by raising tax rates. Exactly. Second point in fairness is, is the OECD point that I made. If you look across industrial countries, the US actually has by far the most progressive tax system. We rely much more on taxes that affect high income individuals than peer countries, and we do so for the reason I suggested. But the third point I wanted to mention is if you add up all of the tax increases on the rich that are currently being discussed in Washington, it's about 1% of GDP. The Congressional Budget Office has come up tonight. They would tell you that the long-term problem in Social Security and Medicare alone is on the order of 10 percentage points of GDP. Anybody who's selling you the taxes on the rich are going to get us out of the fiscal hole doesn't know the man. No, Glenn, I, wait, I, I, just I, one second. Glenn, are you already <laughs> saying, yeah. Glenn, are you, are you saying that the, that the American system compared to Europe is more fair than any European tax system? I'm saying it's more progressive. I think it's... Uh, is progressive it's, fair? It's, we need a progressive tax system. The question is, can we balance progressivity and growth? We definitely can. Robert Rice. Uh, uh, look at... Uh, first of all, the reason that the European tax system looks more progressive than ours is because the gap between the rich and the poor in Europe is not nearly as great as it is in the United States. We have the highest gap between the rich and the poor. Secondly, Arthur Laffer just admitted something that I hope you heard, and that is that when you close loopholes that are taken advantage of, uh, advantage of mostly by the rich, you are, in a sense, raising their taxes. Mm -hmm. They are Absolutely. spend. They are actually providing more in taxes. The proposition we are debating yeah. is whether the rich are taxed enough. We are saying, Mark and I, that that is wrong. The rich are not taxed enough. If one way we use to get the rich to pay more is to close, for example, the carried interest loophole that allows private equity managers to treat their income as capital gains taxed at 15%, that means that Mitt Romney will be taxed more than he is now. Oh, Dick, Robert, come on. Uh, uh, Art come Laffer. on. Art Laffer. You, got, you got tax rate reduction. If you did tax rate reduction, broaden the base, and you created prosperity, of course we all want more revenues. We don't want deficits. I mean, no one wants it. How do you get it? The way you get it, by the way, is the way Reagan Kennedy, Clinton, and also uh, uh, Harding and Coolidge did it in the U.S., lowering tax rates and creating prosperity with a broad base. That's what this proposition of the tax you, rates, the just, tax just, rates just on the rich are. Are you hear the, avoid the logical avoidance that is going on on Ro that well, side of the aisle? I, actually, I want to put that question to you, Art. The, the Robert, Robert's I'm bigger point, than you are, <laughs> Robert, <laughs> but just barely. Robert's point is that closing these loopholes would result in the wealthy paying more of their taxes because they have more access to these loopholes now. Therefore, their taxes would be raised. Therefore, he's saying that you're actually arguing for their side. No, when well, that's loopholes. just not true unless it's a parallel arithmetic because the marginal tax rates are coming down at the same time. So what you're doing is raising revenue in a more efficient way. Some right. individuals may pay more. And if the economy grows, virtually everyone will pay more, and that's just fine. But raising marginal tax rates, which has been the siren song of the tax debate, is just wrong. No, well, no, can I, can I you agree Sandy. that we should lower tax rates on the rich? If we generate Mark tax Sandy. revenue. OK. I, but think, I, don't, I think you just yeah. agreed can, with can us. I, can, I, can I make a few points <laughs> yes, Mark in, 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 uh, in um, response to some of the points that are made? First, uh, this, is, this is my view. Uh, Glenn, I, I think we need to address uh, spending. Uh, we have to. I mean, if you look at Simpson Bowles or any proposal that's reasonable, most of the onus of addressing our fiscal problems is on the spending side. So I'm, I'm with you on that. But all of these proposals also say we needed to generate revenue. We, you know, this has got to be a shared burden uh, in terms of spending and, and tax. So um, no, no disagreement there. The second thing I'd say is that uh, if we can raise tax revenue by lowering uh, the deductions and credits in the tax code, and there's some very creative ways of doing it. Um, Marty Feldstein has a great proposal. Both Governor Romney and President Obama have put proposals that are not dissimilar in this regard in terms of capping uh, the amount of uh, deductions and credits that an individual can take, and that would burden, in theory, would land on higher income households. I'm all for that. Um, but I think it's also important that uh, we do this in a way that we're clear-eyed because in a political sense, a political economy sense, 
because we know it's going to be really hard to, to scale back those deductions and credits in the tax code. It's, you know, for every credit and deduction in the code, there is a constituency that literally will go to war for it. So we know that. So in that context, we, may, we have to think about, well, maybe we have to raise marginal rates uh, to generate that revenue, to get to the point where we're going to address our long-term fiscal problems. And for, for example, as a, the, as, a, as a temporary thing, not as a long-term principle of the way. You yeah, know, absolutely. Let's let Glenn Hubbard. Let's let bring in Glenn Hubbard, please. You can't do that either in the short term or the long term. So let's be clear: the current budget has spending three full three percentage points higher than traditional levels in the country. It is proposing to raise taxes on high-income people by one percent of GDP, and we just don't know what happens to the other two. In the long term, as I've said, just Social Security and Medicare alone are 10 times the cost, right. even of the most optimistic tax increases. So taxes aren't even an important part of this conversation. Okay. And to the extent that they are, they would have to follow the European model, which is to raise them on everyone, a consumption tax. Robert I, uh, uh, we're getting tangled in a semantic dispute. And I, want, and I want to be very, very clear about what we are actually arguing. There are two ways of raising revenues. Almost everybody up here agrees, I think, that we've got to raise some revenues. We may have to do a lot of spending reductions as well, but we've got to raise some revenues if we're going to deal with the budget deficit problem. There are two ways of doing it. One is raising marginal income tax rates, and the second is closing loopholes. Now, the question really is, when you do one or both of those, are you going to have the rich paying more, or is the middle class going to have to pay more, or the poor going to have to pay more? What Mark and I are saying is that when you get more revenue, either by closing loopholes or by raising marginal rates, the rich should end up paying more as a matter of logic, as a matter of fairness, as a matter of history, as a matter of common sense. All right, Art Laffer, so your opponent is saying this is a debate about, about this is a debate about whose hide is it going to come out of, and he's yeah. saying it needs to come out of the rich's hide. Let's just talk about it. Of course you do. I mean, and there's nothing wrong with the, more, uh, the rich paying more in taxes if with the prosperity, which is exactly what happened, what I showed in the numbers there during the Roaring Twenties. The rich paid more as a share of GDP by lowering rates dramatically. Perfect. If you look at the Kennedy period, the rich paid a lot more as a share of GDP by lowering rates dramatically. Yeah, this, under, the Ken, under the Reagan-Clinton period, the rich paid a lot more by lowering rates dramatically and creating prosperity. That is the dream. One more and thing. that's where we go. You cannot balance the budget on the backs of the unemployed. You just plain can't. Robert. And that's I, what I, you have to do. I, I, think, I think that when Arthur Laffer, my dear friend, when you just said, My friend has when you kind just of a said term that it's fine, it's fine for the rich to pay more through closing loopholes, I think you just lost the entire debate. But, like, but, 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 but beyond that, I, I want to point out this is an interesting historic footnote. Uh, Arthur, you keep going back to the 1920s, the Roaring Twenties. There were two years over the last century, two years, in which the richest Americans took home the highest percentage of total income in America. Those two years were 1928 and 2007. Now, does it strike anybody here interesting <laughs> as a matter of what happens when the rich take home so much of the total income? Does it strike anybody here that there may be a consequence? <laughs> there may be. But Robert, Robert how, do, how do you relate that to this motion? Land that on, on this motion. I'm sorry? Relate that point to this motion. Uh, the motion should not be voted for. It's an insane motion. Can, can I make no, one no, other point? No, no, no. Can I make one other point? I, I, I think you did some nice grandstanding, but you didn't land yeah. it in well, the it motion. So, good. Mark, take John, it. I, I want to make one other. Uh, let, let me advance the ball just a little bit. Please. And that is, um, uh, it's very important to look at effective tax rates. So that's how much I pay in tax relative to the income I earn. Not the marginal rates, it's the effective tax rates. And if you look at effective tax rates across the income distribution, and not just income tax, but you consider the payroll tax, you consider the incidence of corporate tax, uh, excise taxes, you, know, you, you roll it all up. This is data, you can go look it up. It's, it's Congressional Budget Office data, and they have it over time. 
It's true that effective tax rates have fallen for everybody across the income distribution since um, uh, the data begins, 1979, 1980. Uh, but it's also true that it's falling very significantly for higher income households. And in fact, uh, interesting statistic, for the top 1% of earners, the decline in the effective tax rate 1979 to 2010 has declined by more than any, any other income group, the effective tax rate. So you can argue, and this is often an argument you will hear, that the wealthy pay their uh, a higher share of total taxes. But the reason is because they're earning so much more income, and their effective tax rate is a let's, lot Let's bring in Glenn Hubbard. Yeah, again, if you look both at shares of income and shares of taxes paid, the U.S. is the most progressive. The CBO, not to get too much into the weeds here, really is not attributing the corporation income tax in, in any way that's really going to change those numbers. And on tax reform and growth, it is certainly the case that if we broaden the base and lower the rates, we would get growth. Otherwise, why are we going to do tax reform? And that's fine that that will raise revenue. But we are not arguing for non-revenue neutral tax changes. It's up to you to argue that raising marginal rates, which you've referred to a few times this evening, actually is the way to go. Yes. Uh, can that's I, can it. I, I just say back at, uh, uh, John, you, you asked me, uh, why is it relevant that in two years, that is 1928 and 2007, the rich took home the highest percentage of total income I they've why taken? It's relevant to the motion. It's relevant to the motion in the following way. Because behind this motion is a question about the relationship between fairness and economic growth. That's what we are discussing tonight. And my contention, and the contention that I think Mark agrees with as well, is that there is not an inconsistency between fairness and economic growth. In fact, the rich would do better with a smaller share of a rapidly growing economy than a large share of an economy that's dead in the water. Why? Because it's dead in the water because the distribution of income is so yeah, that's crazy. Just, that's, yeah. And that's why, and, and, and that is directly relevant to the point that Arthur uh, and, uh, and Glenn are, are making, or are attempting to make, uh, and are not making actually very well. Uh -huh. <laughs> there, you, Art Laffer. There he was almost nice. No. Uh, but seriously, I mean, the point of it here is let's take the 20s that, that you're talking about. We had those tax cuts. We had that growth. We had the rich becoming very prosperous. There's nothing wrong with the rich being rich. The problem is when the poor are poor. The dream has always been to make the poor rich. And during the 20s, when we had the roaring 20s, no other country did the tax codes we did. After World War I, they all stayed in depression the whole time. That is the key here. There's nothing wrong with the prosperity we had from the 80s on. But I'll tell you what happened in the 1920s. And the they same, paid a lot more in taxes. taxes. And the exact same thing happened leading up to the crash of 2008. Be, and can, that is can, the median wages, median wages were stuck in the mud. The, really, the growth and the gains from growth went to the top. What happened? People in the middle, in order to maintain their standard of living, they borrowed. They borrowed and they borrowed. And people at the top gambled so. and they gambled recklessly. And those bubbles exploded in 1929 and in 2008. I, again, a great applause line, but I'm not seeing how this is justifying taxing yeah, the I, rich. But I want to bring Glenn Hubbard. Mark very helpfully earlier referred to a lot of structural problems facing the country. And those are problems that are, are subject of, a, of another debate. But it is very important to ask the question to you, Mark, or to you, Bob, how is it that raising marginal tax rates on high-income people gets at any of those structural problems? You referred to globalization. There are skill gaps among low-income people. I'm not connecting the dots. Okay from your tax okay. policy to dealing with a problem that actually should concern America? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I think it's important that we address the distribution of income and wealth, because if we don't, we're going to have the situation that Arthur uh, joked about, but is very serious, and that is that the wealthy will capture the system. He joked about buying a senator, buying a congressman. I don't think that's a joke. I mean, I it's think not. that's a very serious issue. It's happening. And we can't allow that to happen. So this, this is the reason why we have to be very, very cognizant of this. We have to have enough revenue that goes to the government to be able to build out the infrastructure we need. We, we need the revenue to go to the government sufficient to educate the population and bring the skill attainment of those workers that are getting creamed by China up so that they can compete in a global economy. 
we can't do that unless we have sufficient revenue. Now, we all know revenue is very low, 17% of GDP. Uh, since 1980, the uh, revenue to GDP ratio has averaged 19.5%. It's very, very low. Government spending is high. I'm all for getting government spending down. I think that's absolutely correct. But we also have to, in a balanced way, get Mark, revenue can up. I, can, I, can, can I make I one other point? I have to make one sure, other point. Because yeah. this, this goes right to Arthur's uh, yeah, discussion. I'll, you know, Arthur, you may be right. You know, you may be right about don't ta No, wait. You don't have to no, no, no. That to this, is, this is very important. <laughs> You know, you argue lower tax rates uh, improve economic growth, all else being equal. And, you know, I have some sympathy to that argument when we're lowering tax rates from 90 percent, which is what they were when Kennedy took office, and we lowered them to 70, and Ronald Reagan took them from 70 to 28. You know, the, the academic literature on this, frankly, is not clear. You, you know, there's no proof academically. But, okay, I'm sympathetic to the idea. But what I think is prudent, if I were a prudent planner, and if I was sitting at the OMB or the CBO, I'd say, you know what, we better, if we raise taxes or lower tax rates, if we move tax rates, we better think about this in an accounting sense. Not in, we can generate some re uh, economic growth and that's gonna generate revenue, and by the way, the, the kids are gonna be dancing in the streets and eating chocolate bars. You know, that's, that's not what we should be doing. We should be thinking about this in a purely accounting well, and if it all works out and you're right, that's gravy. We're fine. And it will, and I am. Glenn Hubbard. <laughs> I think it's important to know that there is actually a lot of work in economics and pretty conclusive about the positive effects of tax reform. It's one of the few not that controversial. No one's arguing tax reform, Glenn. Well, well, no one's arguing. Oh, yeah, we are. Lowering rates, broadening the base, that's one of the most fundamental results in economics. And I think the, the beauty has been, in, or the difficulty, the politicians are normally scared. But frankly, as an economic matter, I don't think it's controversial. If you had the size of government that we had before the financial crisis, the normally functioning tax system will roughly fund that size of government. If you'd like in your description of more for education and more for infrastructure, if what you mean is you'd like a bigger government, no. I'll come back to the point I made before. You can't fund that on taxing the rich. That's just math. But, uh, let me, let, let's Can specific. I just, one, why Can not, I? why not? Because the, if you look at all of the tax increases that are currently being proposed, and I haven't heard any politician on the left say they'd like even more, that's about 1% of GDP. The present budget has an elevated spending level of more than 3% of GDP, and that's before the entitlement program. But isn't there still a lot of upward room to raise rates on, on the rich, other than I, what's proposed now? I think there's a lot of pushback both from economists and probably more important from politicians on the tax increases that are being proposed now. Can, can I yeah, get, even why, if you double why, them, why, right. why is there pushback right. on, from politicians on increasing taxes on the rich or closing loopholes that the rich take advantage of? It's because of the increasing political power of many of those same rich. That is the closed system we are dealing with. That is one of the reasons that you've got that, to start addressing this it. issue you of inequality. You can't dismiss it. You can't. can't. Yeah. That's not true. Um, Art Laffer. These are exactly the problems we had in 86. And that's exactly what we did. We took all of these loopholes and dumped them all, and we got a broader base. Reagan said he would not, he would veto the bill if it were either tax raising or tax lowering. It was a tax reform bill that went across. We lowered the highest rate from 50% to 28%. And in the Senate, we got 97 votes, three against us, and all these others voted with us. It was obvious for all those politicians. And they did it. It's quite obvious right now John, as well. John, can I just, I, yeah, I, Mark, I, I just wanna, Sandy. I just wanna present some numbers. These are just, just accounting, it comes from Simpson Bowles. Not a ton of numbers. Okay, this is pretty straightforward. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, under Simpson Bowles, to achieve something you, what you might call fiscal sustainability, that is deficits in the future that are small enough that our debt to GDP ratio stabilizes, uh, with a, uh, a little bit of arithmetic, we need three trillion dollars in deficit reduction over ten years. You know, we can debate the number, but let's go with it. Simpson Bowles would say, Diminishing Rivlin would say, let's do two trillion in government spending. Let's get one trillion in tax revenue, right? And they would say, let's do the tax revenue by broadening a base. And but if we can't broaden the base, we got to get the revenue from some, somewhere, uh, right? And if you do so those things, then then Glenn. The uh, expenditure to GDP ratio goes to 21%, that's the average since 1980, and the revenue to GDP goes to 19%, that's the average since 1980, but, and we're going. That's actually, maybe we could just correct the numbers. So okay, Bulls, Bulls Simpson yeah. actually would raise Is everybody two, getting this down? 
because yeah. yeah. this no, is when economists really get I down know, there. So, I know. It's a, so it's Bull a problem. Simpson would raise yeah. two percentage points of GDP in revenue to fund a 21 percent government. Yes. But it's important again to understand that Bull Simpson is delivering marginal rates at Reagan era levels. There wasn't any discussion in Bull Simpson of oh well if we can't do this we'll do that. Bull Simpson yeah. is a classic. Right. Mark on the base, lower let, the rates. No, let, let me pull something out. Let me pull something out of it's one trillion. Gentlemen, let me pull something out of the exchange we're getting, we're we've just been through and bring to Mark Zandi. Basically, Glenn Hubbard was saying that he understood what your aspirations were for uh, funding certain kinds of government programs that would be restorative, education, et cetera. And he said there's, that the, you can't get it from the wealthy, that, it, that if you, it, you, politically you can't get it, you can't raise rates to that degree for the reason Bob gave, because it's a closed loop. I want to know economically, could you get it? Because their argument is that economically you can't because the, the behavior of the wealthy would change in such a way that they just wouldn't, they wouldn't participate. Number one, they wouldn't participate. They would move their money offshore, and they wouldn't invest here. And that, that's kind of the core of their argument. Can you take that on? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't think that, uh, first of all, I think the best way of approaching this is broadening the tax base. That's, I'm on board with that. But if we have to go down, the, if we can't raise the revenue, the trillion in revenue through tax, tax uh, broadening, I'm all for raising marginal rates. But when I talk about raising marginal rates, I'm talking about putting them back to the, the era when, when this fellow was labor secretary and generating 22 million jobs. I'm talking about 35% today to 39.6% on personal income. And you can, we can talk about cap gains and dividend income and so forth, and Obamacare and health care tax, all those kinds of things. That, those kinds of things will generate a trillion revenue. And I don't think, and again, this is my view experience, I don't think American, the American wealthy are going to move offshore uh, and, and not pay their taxes. Uh, look at, uh, this is, to me, they are, we, we know that they aren't. We know that they aren't because there have been a number of experiments. Uh, one experiment is an experiment that we ran in this country between 1946 and 1981, when tax rates, as I said before, officially marginal tax rates were at least 70 percent, and the effective rate after deductions and tax credits was about 54, 55, 56 percent. Maybe it was slightly more difficult then to move abroad or shift your money abroad. That's true. But also, legally, uh, we could have then, as we can now, make it very difficult to do that. The real issue here, and Glenn, what you keep on wanting to do, and Art, you do too, is you are saying, in effect, we ought to broaden the base and not raise marginal rates. Lower them. And, what you, yeah, and what you're hearing from us is we're happy to do whatever you want to do to raise revenues. That is, close the loopholes or raise the rates as long as most of those revenues come from the people who are best situated to bear that burden. And that is the rich who are richer now than they've ever been as a proportion of total income. Now, uh, if you agree with us, Oh, then oh, oh. this proposition, All right. you have to I vote let, again. I want, to let, I want to let Glenn Hubbard no, respond I mean, to that, but I, I, right after his answer, I'm going to come to you for questions, so prepare terse, focused questions on this motion, and, uh, and uh, we'll be delighted to have you participate. Three, three, three quick points. First of all, again... You don't have to what, be that quick. He was pretty long. Yeah, well, what, what Art and I are arguing is to the extent that revenues come from faster growth from a reform system, we're fine for that. You, you keep moving the goalposts, but you're talking about marginal rates and, uh, and not that. Second, there are significant real effects of raising taxes on business owners. There's a huge body of research out there. You might not like it, but it is there. And the third, the question to you about your aspirations. Again, Social Security and Medicare, there's two programs are on track to rise 10 percentage points of GDP. Now, if you want to tax finance that, you mentioned that a healthy, healthy revenue I share in Glenn. GDP is 19 percent. You'd have to raise every tax in the country herring. 60 That's percent. That's a red herring. I don't. You I'm not can't proposing that. get there from here. I, I, th I agree with you. We need to, to entitlement reform and we need spending cuts. Yeah, let me, I'm on board right. with that. Let's go to some questions from the audience. And uh, this, sir, right down. Yeah, right there. Yeah. And if you. If you just p wait for a pause for the camera to find you, and uh, if, it would help actually if you could step out to your uh, left just so that you're bright in a, the brighter light and let us know your name and really a good question. Yeah. I'm an Adam of Columbia Business School. 
Yes, I did. The question is from uh -oh. Mr. Lefer. Hey, 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 is this fair? <laughs> <laughs> We're everywhere. <laughs> wait, wait, wait till you hear the question. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> oh, My question is to Mr. Lefer. You just took the example of Warren Buffett, who's on a stated income of 40 million, paid 7 million in taxes, whereas you think his income was 12 billion. So yes. if whatever way the loopholes are closed or the the rates are increased, don't you think the rich man should be paying more and therefore don't you think this motion yeah. that you're Warren for is, is a Columbia Business School graduate. That's before okay. you answer this question. Art, Art Laffer, <laughs> take that question. Let me just do two things. There are two ways of raising revenues. One is to broaden the base and one is to lower rates, not raise them. And that is the way to get your prosperity. As you looked at every time you go back to the, the Kennedy period where rates were much higher and all that. When Kennedy lowered those rates, guess what happened to revenues? They went up as a share of GDP, not down. From the top 1% of income earners. Not only did those revenues go up, but there were secondary and tertiary rate revenues going in for the jobs that they created, the output, the employment, the production. All of that, they are huge revenue raises. That is not true of any other income group. It's not. You raise tax rates on the poor or the middle income and you collect more revenues, but not on the rich. You want more revenues from the rich, which I do. What you do is you broaden the base and you lower the rates and both of those will bring you more revenues. How, how low would you period. lower them? How, how low would you go? I'm well, just, it I'm it doesn't go to zero. I mean, Let's put zero, it there. You want to put them at zero? I will stipulate today. Bull Simpson seems like 28% yeah, and, seems like a good place. And you know, we did Can, it in 86 down to 20, 28%. That's a good number. Or leave it. Why where not it lower is. though? How about why not where why well, not? you can, you I'm can maybe I'm go asking lower. You, I mean, why not 15%? If you broaden the base why not enough, 10? Why not if five? you if you were able, I mean, I will none of you guys will agree with me here, but if you taxed unrealized capital gains and raised the basis, you could get it really low. If you wouldn't allow all the 501c3s and have football tickets in Oklahoma be tax exempt, I think you could get it really low. There's a huge amount of income out there that is not taxed at all. Well, the question, and then you lower the rate right. like I did with Robert, Jerry Robert, Brown. Robert Rice, and I want to go on to the question Robert before Rice. the House. The question before the House is not do you broaden the base and do you raise or lower marginal rates. The question is should the rich yeah. pay more or are the rich taxed enough? Now, let's take an example. Take the mortgage interest deduction, which is the most sacred of sacred cows. Now, here's what we know about the mortgage interest deduction. Mortgage interest deduction is essentially a subsidy for housing. But who gets the lion's share of the benefit of the mortgage interest deduction? Well, here's what we know. That four times more of that subsidy goes to the top 20% of Americans than the total exactly. amount of public housing assistance that goes to the bottom 20% of Americans. So why not limit the total mortgage interest deduction per year to something like, let's say, $10,000 per year? Why not limit other deductions to, say, a total of ten or $12,000 a year? You, if you do that, you are increasing revenues from the rich. If you do that, you are actually voting against the proposition. I mean, can All I right, I, I, wanna, I wanna go to another question, but first I, I wanna remind you that we are in the question and answer section of this Intelligence Squared US debate. I'm John Donvan, your moderator. We have two teams of two who are arguing it out over this motion, the rich are taxed enough. Another question from the audience. Right down front here. I'm um, Jackie Hatler here. I wanted to direct this question to you guys um, with respect you, to- You want to address to the side arguing against yes, the motion? Yes, to the, mm -hmm. the con side. Um, I wanted to know what you guys think about um, small businesses. Are they really going to be affected um, if the tax rate increases? I love small businesses. Uh, my, my father was a small businessman. He was small and he was a small businessman. Uh, uh, but look, if we, uh, if we, for example, as a nation decide uh, that next year we are going to continue the Bush tax cuts for people earning under $250,000, but the income over $250,000 is going to go back to the Clinton kind of rates, 
Uh, is that going to be such a huge burden for small businesses? Well, only about 2 to 3 percent of small businesses earn over $250,000, and we're only talking about that amount of income over $250,000. So, so a small business person who, owns, uh, who earns $251,000 that year is only going to be paying the Clinton rate on $1,000 of income. And by the way, that Clinton rate was not so onerous. Small businesses did much better under Bill Clinton than they've been doing recently Glenn over Hubbard. the last 10 years. The reference to a small number of small businesses um, being at the top misses the fact that about half of the people in the top 1% are business owners. And if you look at the calculation that I made for you, if you compare what's going to happen to investment and hiring by those individuals, because they're paying taxes at individual rates, you're looking at changes on the order of 50% in investment and 14% in hiring in an era when the economy is struggling. You know, there's a reason the president took a pass on raising marginal rates the last time. OK, another question? Yeah, can I? Oh, just, sure, Mark Sandy. Just to well, reinforce yeah. the point, this is why I told you this, my story about being the, the egghead entrepreneur. Because I was an S chapter corporation. I was one of those folks in the top 3%. And my experience says, no, it doesn't matter. I, you know, I'm driven by lots of other things. And raising marginal rates from 35 to 40 or 45, it's not going to make a difference in terms of my thinking. So no, the, my, my experience, and I don't think the data suggests that this is going to have a significant impact. One other thing about small business that I just think it's very important to point out, that most small businesses are proprietorships. They're they're, uh, they're uh, professionals like doctors and dentists, uh, plumbers, electricians. They're not making $250,000, and they're not going to be affected by this. The folks that are going to be affected by this are, you know, they're, they're, they're hedge fund owners. They're uh, different kinds of small businesses that, you know, they're motivated by different things. So the, the, when people talk about small business, they're, they have some, they're thinking about something totally different than the folks that will be affected by the higher marginal rates that we're talking about here. Okay, um, ma'am. Thanks. Could you stand up? Thanks, just so we can find you with the camera. I, 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 if it was up and, to and, me. And would you, would you mind telling us your name also? Uh, my name is Reba Shemansky. Uh, if it was up to me, I'd love the marginal tax rate to go back to 91%. However, most wealthy people don't pay the marginal tax rate. They get paid in capital gains or carried interest, like your guy, Mitt Romney. Therefore, no. don't you feel that the capital gains tax... Actually, he gets dividends, but that's okay. Don't you think... <laughs> may, please let me finish. Don't you think the capital gains tax should equal the marginal tax rate? And doesn't Mitt Romney feel guilty that he pays all right, the same tax rate All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. You've just disqualified yourself. I'm going to take another question. Because, because we're not playing it that way. Um, <laughs> sir, right there. Yeah. Thanks. My name is John Goldberg. Uh, the question is to uh, Mr. Hubbard and Mr. Laffert. Um, how much do you think that the social contract sort of, of um, the, the sort of justice or moral element should play into the conversation? And to be specific, um, one of the debates, um, Mr. Romney said that um, he still wants the top 5% to pay 60% of collections. Do you think that is the right number? Um, should it not go up from there? Because um, I think that's sort you of. Mind, do you mind? Um, and the reason I say this is that this debate will, we hope, will live on for months and be heard. Not to rephrase your question without actually needing to make the reference to the recent debate, because I think you can, and it would, it would let us use this question. Okay. Thanks. Um, so the question is, I guess I've heard that the top five percent of um, <laughs> earners uh, <laughs> can should produce. <laughs> 60% of the collections, uh, do you think that's about the right uh, number? I think there's no question from a tax fairness or social justice point of view that we need a progressive tax system. The wealthy in our society should pay a disproportionate share of the tax burden, and I don't think any serious, at least economist, has suggested otherwise. But to me, there's a strong element of social justice that's forgotten in that conversation. And this goes back to the conversation Mark and I were having earlier. We really need a society that helps put people back on the ladder. And that's not a discussion of whose marginal tax rate is X or Y. 
but a discussion is how as a country we're going to help those people succeed. That's the social justice. Uh, Bob Reich. But I think that I, I think when uh, here I want to use the opportunity I have, we have to agree. You're exactly right, Glenn. We want an economy and a society that enables everybody to have an opportunity to make the most of themselves and to go up that ladder. But as the gap grows, what we are finding is that upward mobility in America is slowing. In fact, relative to places like Canada, we have a much slower degree of upward mobility. The chances that a poor kid is going to be a poor adult is greater in the United States than it is not only in Canada, but, but greater Bob, than in Germany, is it, is greater this, than in most of Europe, greater than every place in rich nations other than Britain and think, Italy. Is it, is it tax-related, this? It this is tax-related. So, so, so of course end, it's yeah. tax-related, because if we didn't have the problem of upward mobility, that is, if people could easily move upward, then the issue of inequality and the it, moral essence of what we are talking about would not be but is as the tax, difficult. But is the tax system a it's solution? Is the tax, tax system a lever John, or an the reason, instrument? The I? reason that this proposition yeah. is ludicrous and why everybody should vote against it is because we have a system right now that it, where the dice are loaded. They're loaded in favor of people who but are, are you, very wealthy. But are you arguing to use the tax system to unload the dice? Well, the two ways. Now, Mark said before, and I think it's a very important point, that if we are going to have enough revenues to ensure that every child in America has an adequate education, not only K through 12, but hopefully early childhood education, hopefully access to a good public university or even private university, if education is going to be back to where it was in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s in terms of quality for every young child, that is going to take whether we want it or not, that's going to take some money to do. And if the rich are not going to pitch in, we are not going to be able to do it. Glenn Hubbard. First of all, it's useful to know that the tax system in the U.S. does actually lean against, in a very powerful way, some of the forces that Bob and Mark have mentioned. I already mentioned that in the context of the OECD. It's also the case, though, that there's a pretty poor link between changing marginal tax rates at the top and accomplishing much of any of this. It's really a question of setting priorities in government. Do we want to be a country that has a few entitlement programs that have all of our spending dollars, or do we want to invest in the future? That's a very legitimate discussion, but it has nothing to do with taxing the rich. Mark Sandy. Yeah, I, uh, I, I want to get to a point that Glenn has been making, and it's a, it's a, it's a reasonable one. The tax code does help reduce the, uh, the skewing of the distribution of in income and wealth. If you look uh, at the so-called Gini coefficient, another, I'm sorry, but this is very easy. So Gini coefficient, <laughs> the best way to measure the income distribution, if it's zero, you've got everyone getting the same income. If it's one, it, that's bad. One person's getting all the income. So the Gini coefficient pre-tax is... Uh, back in 1980 was uh, 0.38. Today it's 0.48. So that means the distribution of income is getting uh, wider. Uh, take the tax code, run it through, calculate the Gini coefficient. We now go from 0.34 to 0.44. So yeah, it did in fact reduce the uh, skewing of the distribution of income and wealth, but the point is the skewing is still uh, very significant and getting wider by the, t by the day. And this is a very significant problem. Our tax code really hasn't helped with that issue. Now, well, I, put I, differently, yeah, the skewness so. is a pre-tax phenomenon. Right. It relates to real phenomena out there in the world, and we can address those phenomena, but not with the tax but code. But no, we can, we, this is my point, this is the key point. We have a fiscal problem. We have to address the fiscal problem. We have to do that by looking, uh, addressing the fiscal problem through the prism of what it means for the distribution of income and wealth. We cannot ignore that when we think about government spending and government spending cutbacks and tax revenue. We have to think about it in the context of tax revenue. But you've got to think of it in Our dynamic lesson. terms. That's what you've got to do is what it does to the growth path, what it does to the poverty, the unemployment. Never before have so many people been so unemployed as they are amongst the poor, amongst the minorities. Uh, you know, uh, it's just shocking what's happening today because of the growth being lost. We've got to achieve 
the income distribution we want and the prosperity Arthur, we want I, in the I poor a, through Arthur, growth. Arthur, I have a, a tweeted question from a Joshua Walensky who is asking about trading off the capital gains tax versus the income tax, and he's basically saying should should rates be lowered, should rates be raised on income that comes from buying and selling stuff versus lowered on people who actually make stuff for a living? Well, my view is it should be flat rate across the board, just the way it was. I th we raised capital gains tax rate in 1986 from 20 to 28 percent. We made it the same as every other. I think that's the way you should go. I think you should get it so that all forms of income are the same. Okay. Um, that's not the view of the rest of the table, just yeah. so there's no, no it, misconception. That's true. I um, am truly for a flat tax across the board and get the hell out of the way and let people produce. The optimal tax food. on saving is zero. I'm Carl Pope, and Dr. Hubbard, I sense a deal, and I want to offer you the deal that I think the other side would take, but I'm not certain you would. The four of you together come up with $2 trillion in cuts. You each have $500 billion dollars, which come up with $2 trillion together, you and Dr. Laffer then have to come up with some package of your choosing, unhampered by politics, of a trillion dollars from cutting marginal rates, closing loopholes, whatever you like, with the sole condition being that the trillion dollars has to be paid by the upper 1%. I need you and to. Then, I need. I need you but, to to but, zoom in for a landing here. Okay, and <laughs> all of the all of the additional revenues which result from Dr. Laffer's anticipated growth, if you do it right, the four of you each get to spend a quarter of it, either on the deficit or more federal spending. Okay. But would I'm, you take that deal? I didn't understand your question. Well, if I if I, underst if I understand I, the I question, the I can give a pretty simple answer to it. There's a. A recent study that Harvey Rosen, who's a professor at Princeton, has done, it is possible to lower marginal tax rates substantially, broaden the base, get down to a 28% rate, with the growth, still have the high-income people pay exactly the same, the same tax share, that is, the money is coming from them. If that was your question, that's the answer. Okay. But you see, <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Everybody this got the question, is, but We're me. getting very close. Okay. <laughs> It's getting me. Close, Sorry. close to the core of the issue. Glenn, Glenn, the issue is not broadening the tax base and lowering the rates so the, the wealthy pay the same as they're paying now. Well, same the, share. Same the same share. Dollars. The, the question, the question is, yeah. shouldn't That's the wealthy the be paying a larger share? Yeah. And what Mark and I have been arguing is that you have got to, if you are talking about getting the deficit down, reducing the debt, uh, not only do you have to cut federal spending, you also have to rely on some net increase in revenues. And that net increase in revenues, we believe, should come primarily, whether it's base broadening or rate increasing, it should come primarily from the wealthy. And if you agree with us, then you think this proposition is wrong. Yeah. Let me just say, yeah, you, you've moved I, the goalpost several times no, tonight, no, no, but, no, but it the is the case I that Sir, it's the same I, goal. I don't. In the middle yeah. uh, here, this gentleman in a blue, uh, blue necktie. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, my name is Phil Melville. A question broadly for the group. I think you all believe growth is good, but I would like to understand that I'm IMF not sure about art on that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, um, the IMF, IMF recently put out a paper talking about multipliers, that tax increases have a greater impact on the economy than spending cuts. Do you believe that's true? And if so, particularly to Mr. Zandi, why would you advocate increasing taxes when they have a disproportionate effect on the economy? Mark Sandy. Well, uh, to be clear, and just to repeat myself, I'm all for uh, raising tax revenue from broadening the tax base. I would prefer not to raise tax rates on anybody. I'd like to even cut them. And in fact, if we broaden the base enough, Art's right, we can lower the tax rates and generate revenue, and that has to come from higher income households. So let's just make that very clear. Now, if we're debating the uh, impacts of taxes and spending, it's just the opposite. I mean, I, uh, my view is the spending multipliers are larger than the tax multipliers. In general, on average, you know, it depends on the situation, the tax and the spending, so forth and so on. But, you know, on average, uh, that's the case. The spending multipliers are larger. Now, that I'm, I, as you, but you've heard me before say, I, I think most of the onus of deficit reduction, of achieving fiscal sustainability, 
has to be on the spending cuts. Because if you look, again, at current spending and current revenue, it's mostly the spending that's out of line relative to our historical norms. And we have to get the spending down. And let's let Glenn Hubbard. And Glenn is right. In the longer run, 10, 20, 30 years, we have to address our entitlement programs. That's what's going to kill us. But we can also, and I'll, find, I'll end here, we also should do that through the prism of what it means for the distribution of income and wealth. Glenn Hubbard. I like your question a lot because sometimes we slip into the use of a word like deficit, which is an accounting term. When what we really mean is taxes and spending. Now, your question gets to the core of why it's important to separate those two parts. There's a big difference between changing the path of fiscal policy by raising taxes and, and cutting spending. And I think the bulk of the evidence would suggest, yes, that the tax increase way would be more costly. On the multipliers, I'll tout my intermediate macro textbook. You can turn to the table of multipliers, and you'll see that point pretty much from the literature. One more question, sir. Hi, Van Greenfield. Um, when I listen to all these numbers, I'm kind of reminded of, uh, I guess it was Twain. We have uh, liars, damn liars, and statistics. <laughs> and it seems like uh, probably either of you could argue the other person's point. But the, the question I have is really to uh, uh, the uh, con side. Um, and that is, it seems to me the fundamental question was raised by Glenn at the beginning, which is, what is the size of government that you want. And I'd like to kind of move the debate, or move the question back to what Bob was originally talking about, I think, when he was talking about sufficiency uh, I, and I need, fairness. I, I'm sorry, I need you to What what the What is now. your position on the fundamental question that Glenn raised, which is the real issue is the size of government in terms of fairness, I, I'm going to pass on that because that's not the issue that we're actually I understand that it's related, and I understand it was sandwiched into your argument, but, but I really want to have a question that provokes more of an understanding of this issue of whose hide is the money supposed to come out of memory, right in the middle there. Thank you with respect. Um, you need a microphone to come to you. I, I have no, the radio, <laughs> the radio needs a microphone. You'll sound like a voice off in the distance, and people will wonder what's wrong with that woman. Um, <laughs> my go. name is Brett Popper, and I'd like to know who's the broader base? What is encompassed in this broadening base that we keep okay. talking about? Art Laffer, that's answer that question. That's a great question. That's exactly. Art, Laff Art Laffer. That's, it is. Let that's me exact, tell you. That's exactly what we have been debating. Robert. And you can broaden. It's Art Laffer's it, turn to talk. My turn? <laughs> and it will be your turn right after that, Robert. I did Jerry Brown's flat tax when he ran for president in 1992. We got rid of all federal taxes. You should look at every tax, not just income taxes. We got rid of the income taxes, corporate taxes, payroll taxes, employer and employee. We got rid of excise taxes, capital gains, estate taxes, tariffs. And the only ones we left were sin taxes, which are really small. And in their stead, we had two flat rates, one on business net sales, value added, and one on personal unadjusted gross income. If you did that at full employment, you could have a flat tax rate of 11.8% and have it statically revenue neutral. That's it. You so wouldn't even have the, to uh, file who, a tax return. Who's in the base a, that's boom. been broadened? Everyone's in the base there. All forms where you tax Warren Buffett on his 12 billion income that year, not on 40 million, which is what he had in his AGI after all the legal tax but deductions. The, but, the mom with two, oh, but the mom living on $20,000 who needs to buy her cigarettes would what? also, the mom living on $20,000 with four kids who wants to buy cigarettes. Yeah, but she'd have a job. Yeah. You know, that's right, the whole I, point. Wait, 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 Come wait, 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 wait. on. Bob, Bob Rice. I don't mind her paying for her cigarettes. Okay. Bob I, I want to I I wanna talk to your question because much of this debate has been about exactly that. What do we mean when we talk about broadening the base? And the reality is that average Americans, most people, when they fill out their income taxes, they don't itemize their deductions. Uh, the wealthy have a lot of itemized deductions. They take, I have a lot of tax credits. Uh, they use a lot of, a lot of, accountants and tax planners who are taking advantage of every single possibility. So if you are broadening the base in such a way that you are closing some of those opportunities for tax avoidance or tax mitigation, 
And the net effect is that the wealthy end up paying more than they were paying before. Then you are increasing their taxes, and they are, in a sense, generating more revenues. And if you support that, you don't support tonight's proposition. Glenn, Glenn Hubbard, I, I need you to be terse because we're yeah, out of time. Basically, just to try to really answer your question. There are two things that are on the table being discussed, I think, by tax reformers. One would be a, some sort of cap uh, on deductions that could be a dollar, it could be a percentage of your income. Another would be the approach Bull Simpson took, which really cut back a lot on the deductions of affluent people, but left them more in place for moderate income people. Either one of those uh, would get you there. Can I, can I say this is very, really, you got 10 yeah, seconds. Yeah, really important question because you have to really think about what we're talking about here. Mortgage interest deduction, charitable giving, state and local income taxes, property taxes. You get deductions for education. One second. Medical care, all kinds Mark, of things. I have to and that's why it's here. so difficult to do it. But you're cutting rates at the same time. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes round two of this Intelligence Squared U.S. <laughs> debate. And now we go on to round three. Round three, closing statements by each debater in turn. They will be two minutes each. It is their last chance to try to change your mind before you vote for the second time and choose the winner of this debate. Our motion is the rich are taxed enough. And here to summarize his position against the motion, Robert Reich. He is Robert Reich. He is the professor of, uh, at UC Berkeley and former secretary of labor in the Clinton administration. Um, for, uh, let's, make that a, let's make that an applause line. That would be nice. So, no, 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 no. I, I, I have to be saying it as there needs to be some overlap. So let's do that again. Thank you for your patience on this. I'm the one who messed it up, not you. Summarize his, summarizing his position against the motion, Robert Reich, professor at UC Berkeley and former Secretary of Labor in the Clinton administration. Well, this has been a great debate, and uh, Glenn... Uh, I've enjoyed uh, enormously uh, listening to you and trying to respond to you and besting your arguments. And Arthur Laffer, uh, you are a dear old friend and you're as wrong as you always have been. And, I, uh, and, uh, and Mark Zandi, uh, you are brilliant. All but let, right. me, uh, let, me, let me just say, I, I think that if you look at the proposition here that we are debating tonight, the proposition is simply that the rich are taxed enough and what Mark and I have been saying, whether you couch it in terms of closing loopholes, uh, broadening the base, uh, b increasing marginal income taxes, doesn't matter how you cook it, the, still the question is, given that we have a huge budget deficit, somebody has got to pay a little bit more, even if you do a huge amount of cutting of the budget and cutting spending, you still are going to have to raise some revenues no matter what your ideology is, you're still going to have to raise some revenues. And if you believe, as I do and as Mark does, that the rich should bear the lion's share of that revenue raising, then you've got to, please, for the good of your children and your grandchildren, for the good of America, as solid patriots, you have got to vote against this proposition because it is in its entirety Given where we are in this country right now, given the challenges we face, this proposition is simply and unalterably ludicrous. <laughs> Thank you, Thank Robert you. Rice. Our motion is the rich are taxed enough. And here to summarize his position in support of the motion, Glenn Hubbard. He is the Dean of Columbia Business School and economic advisor to Mitt Romney. Thank, Thank you. You know, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes famously observed that paying taxes is actually the price we pay for living in a civilized society. And a civilized society defends itself, it educates its citizens, it cares for those in need, but it's also got to be a society of opportunity and growth, a society of entrepreneurs and businesses, of seeing the fruits of one's own investment in time and in talents, of encouraging investment for tomorrow and not just consumption for today. Tonight, Art and I have argued that confiscatory success taxes are wrong-headed, but they're also wrong. I'd ask two questions of our partners tonight. First, what evidence suggests 
that the economic consequences of higher tax rates on the successful could improve the employment or the income prospects of the rest. And second, is the nation better off by raising tax rates on high income people or by balancing fairness and prosperity, asking sacrifice from the affluent through the growth consequences of tax reform and reforming our spending programs to be a safety net? The question at hand tonight is a broad one and an important one. This country has long identified with equality of opportunity. And I worry a lot right now in our country about economic opportunity. I'm fond of an example that illustrates my worry with an image of the nation as a tall building, with the bottom flooded out, the penthouse doing fine, and the elevator broken. We could throw rocks at the top, or we could fix the elevator. I think most Americans make the latter choice viscerally. And to the points Art and I have made tonight, throwing rocks doesn't fix the elevator, and to torture the analogy can't pay for it. We need to think about growth and fairness. The case for the proposition tonight is very strong. Tax rates should not rise. The rich are taxed enough. Thank you, Glenn Hubbard. Our motion, the rich are taxed enough. And here to summarize his position against the motion, Mark Zandi, Chief Economist at Moody's Analytics. Well, John, I want to say thank you. Thank you. John, I want to thank you for uh, moderating a great debate. And I, I really do want to thank uh, Glenn and Art for being um, good uh, counterweights here. And, and Bob, thanks for that great comment. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, take, that take that with me. And you're a great guy, too, by the way. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> hey, you know, I, uh, I actually am cheered by our conversation. Uh, you know, it sounds like we were hit, hitting each other over the head. To some degree, we were mostly Bob hitting Art over the head. But uh, I think there's a lot of commonality here. I think there's a lot of uh, agreement. Uh, I think we agree that our fiscal problems need to be addressed, that these are uh, key to our long-term economic success. I think we agree that the distribution of income and wealth is a problem. We're not you know, we're debating a little bit about how we should approach that, but I think we view that as a problem. Um, I think we agree that uh, to address these problems, we, we do need to cut back on future government spending, that the entitlement programs uh, do need reform, and, and we do need to think about it in the context of uh, who's going to pay for that uh, reform. Uh, the, the burden of that should probably fall on higher income households. Uh, and we agree that we need to generate um, we have to think about the tax side of this. Uh, we, we have to focus on this. But here's where we disagree, and that is that we, Bob and I, believe that we need to raise tax revenue, that this has to be a balanced approach to getting us back to something that we would consider appropriate and normal. And I would love to do it through closing deductions and loopholes in the tax code. I think that would be the best way to do it. But we need to be clear-eyed about this, and uh, if we can't do it in the way you would like and I would like, we still need to raise the revenue, and we need to raise the revenue by taxing the rich. So you have to vote against this proposition. The, t the, ta the rich are not taxed enough. Thank, Thank you, you, Mark Zandi. And that is our motion, the rich are taxed enough. And here to make his closing statement in support of the motion, Art Laffer. He is founder and chairman of Laffer Associates and Laffer Investments. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to congratulate Bob and Mark for trying to change the proposition to get a different one. The question is tax rates. And frankly, what Glenn and I have been arguing are, why would you ever want to raise tax rates on the rich if you know it's going to give you less revenue and a less prosperous economy? It's as simple as that. And the evidence out there documents that time and time again. One of the ways I would do is lowering tax rates, but doing it by broadening the tax base to keep revenue neutral, but creating the growth, prosperity, which would give higher revenues, but with lower rates. If you believe in lower rates and a broader base, you must vote for the proposition that the rich are taxed enough. Thank you. Thank you, Art Lafayette. And that concludes our closing statements. And uh, now it is time to learn which side you feel argued best. We're going to ask you again for your second vote to go to the keypad at each of your seats. Our motion is the richer taxed enough. At this point, if you agree with that motion after everything you've heard, push number one on your keypad. 
If you disagree, push number two. If you are, became, remain undecided, push number three. And we will have the results in about a minute and a half. I think the system is still open, so has anybody not voted? Everybody's good. All right. All right, while we're waiting for those results to come, the first thing I want to say is uh, that this was a really, really real pleasure to listen to this debate, the, the way the four of you brought uh, your game to this. A lot of humor, a lot of respect, actually, for one another. It's what we like to do, and I want to thank all of you for doing it. I'd also like to thank everybody who got up to ask a question, including the questions that didn't get used. It takes a lot of nerve to get up and do it. And some of the questions were brilliant and on target, and the others were just darn interesting. <laughs> no, seriously, uh, just not, not exactly uh, where we wanted to take the discussion tonight. So everybody who got up and asked questions, thanks very much for you. And a round of applause for those. And finally, in terms of thanks, we want to thank again the Richmond Center for their participation tonight and in making all of this possible. Thank you to them. We encourage you to, um, to talk about this debate, talk to your friends, tweet about it, uh, blog about it. Uh, our Twitter handle is at IQ2US. Uh, the hashtag is actually hashtag tax debate. Uh, I think earlier I said our hashtag was IQ2US. That will work too, but tax debate is what we're looking for tonight. Um, we have our next debate coming up next month. It will be on November 14th. The motion, the proposition that we will be arguing is legalize drugs. Uh, for the motion, we have Paul Butler. He is a professor at Georgetown Law School. He is also a former federal prosecutor. His partner is Nick Gillespie. He is, uh, Gillespie, he is one of America's foremost libertarians and he is also editor-in-chief of Reason.com and Reason TV. Against the motion, uh, Theodore Dalrymple, he is a retired prison doctor and a fellow at the Manhattan Institute, and Asa Hutchinson, who is a former administrator of the Drug Enforcement Administration and the first undersecretary of the Department of Homeland Security. We have tickets for that debate on November 14th and for our December 5th debate, which is Science Refutes God, uh, available on our website. The uh, website is www.iq2us.org. We would love to see all of you, uh, and we're delighted that we sold out, and we love selling out, so help us do that. Um, well, that doesn't sound right. Don't, we don't want to sell out. No, that's, we would like to sell all of our tickets. If you can't be in the audience for any of those upcoming debates, um, and also if you want to see this one again, there are a lot of ways that you can catch this one and the upcoming ones. Uh, we have a live stream on Fora.tv, and then the uh, debate lives on that site for some time. You can also, uh, as I said earlier, listen to these debates on NPR, uh, that's WNYC right here in New York City, or watch them on WNET and the World Digital Channel. Okay, so you have listened to the arguments for and against on this motion. The rich are taxed enough. We had you vote once before the debate and once again afterwards on where you stand on this motion. Here are the results. The team whose numbers will have changed the most will be declared our winner. Before the debate, 28% were for the motion, 49% against, and 23% undecided. After the debate, 30% are for the motion, that's up 2%, 63% are against, that is up 14%. 7% are undecided, but this means the vote goes for the team arguing against the motion. Our congratulations to them. Thank you for me, John Donvan, and Intelligence Squared US. We'll see you next time. <laughs>